Morning everyone, today's lesson is going to be over chapter six of Animal Farm. This would begin on page 73, so if you could get your books open to that point, um, that's where we'll begin. I want to examine the first couple lines of chapter six for you, so just reading these out loud and then I'll talk to you about them. It says that all that year the animals worked like slaves, but they were all happy in their work. They grudged no effort or sacrifice, well aware that everything that they did was for the benefit of themselves and those of their kind. Um, who would come after them and not for a pack of idle, thieving human beings. Um, sort of ironic, isn't it? That, uh, you know, that they rebelled initially so they could be free. Unfortunately, they don't, they don't realize that they're in a current position that is no different than before. Um, they believe, well, at least we're not under the control of human beings. But they don't realize that, um, you know, the pigs who are, are running the, the farm right now are also... Um, idle and of course thieving um, in many different ways. So I uh, just want to talk to you a little bit about that. We also have, um, you know, a discussion about the work that's going to happen on Sundays. Napoleon says that it's going to be considered voluntary, um, but yet if you decide you don't want to work on Sundays, uh, you're not going to get your full set of rations. So yeah, you might rest, but you're not going to eat as well. Um, so is it really voluntary? No, it's not. Um, we also have some commentary regarding the winter that's coming up. It says it's supposed to be a hard one, and um, we know that you know the farm uh, is, is sort of breaking down slowly at this point. Um, now, regardless of these terrible conditions, we have the animals working hard, actually working harder than ever. Um, one of those animals, as we've discussed before, has been Boxer, okay? Um, he's an invaluable resource when it comes to building the windmill. Uh, I wanted to actually talk about who Boxer represents um, outside of the text. And, uh, you know, Boxer is, is representation of the Russian working class. Um, like Boxer, who does most of the work on the farm, you've got the Russian working class uh, has a lot of uh, strength, a lot of size, right? The muscle. Um, and it could potentially make them powerful. However, okay, they're illiterate and they're trusting like Boxer. And that makes it easy for them to be tricked into following leaders like Napoleon or Stalin. So, you know, while they have that, again, that potential to, uh, to overthrow them and, uh, and do what they believe would be better for them, they don't, they don't have the rest of it, okay? So anyway, just wanna talk about that representation here. Moving on, um, I wanna read this quote to you here. It says that the animals were not badly off throughout the summer in spite of their hardness of their work. If they had no more food than they did in Jones's day, at least they did not have less. I find this to be extremely significant um, because it shows that the animals have begun to accept conditions similar to uh, before the rebellion. And I, I believe this is dangerous, you know, that accepting um, nature. Okay, um, we also see more of Napoleon breaking the founding principles of animalism. Um, one of the things that he, that he does is he announces that they're gonna engage in trade with neighboring farms. Um, this actually causes the animals to be uneasy about this, so they do question it a little bit um, because they remember that they were not supposed to engage in trade or deal with humans or handle money. But um, what's disturbing is that they question and, and doubt what they actually remember about the rules. And then they finally say, well, since I don't know for, sh for certain, I guess this, this is okay. You know, they embrace the new rule. Um, we do have some pigs who do protest this, um, but look what happens when animals try to speak up. You know, notice they're threatened by the dogs. So it's not gonna, not gonna be very good. It's not gonna motivate people to, um, to have those opinions. Um, we also see that Napoleon hires Mr. Wimper, the solicitor, to kind of help them with this, this uh, training here. Let me move forward. I got to get to my next page of notes. Um, you know, remember this association with Mr. Wimper is going to, again, go against the founding principles of animalism. Not supposed to work with humans, but yet here we are. Um, we've got Squealer continuing to blatantly lie to the other animals. Some of those lies would be that the uh, resolution against engaging trade and using money has never been passed. Um, and that was probably a lie that was told by Snowball. So that's one of the things that he says to them. And they keep believing it again because of that lack of intelligence and danger of being un uneducated. Um, another huge thing in this chapter 
is that the pigs move into the farmhouse, which remember has been preserved as a sort of museum, as a way to remember like the rebellion and what not to do. Um, it violates the original commandments and the things that Old Major was warning them against in chapter one. Uh, Squealer attempts to convince the animals that this was never a resolution that had been passed. Uh, we also have rumors that the pigs have been eating in the kitchen, they've been using the recreation room, they've been sleeping in the beds, and, um, you know, Boxer believes this wholeheartedly. Oh, yeah, 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 that never had been passed, it must be okay. Um, but we've got Clover, who is a little skeptical, and she actually attempts to investigate and, and tries to read the commandments painted on the barn. Um, you know, she finds out that the commandment says that animals cannot sleep in bed with sheets, uh, oh, with sheets, sorry, that they cannot sleep in a bed with sheets. That's what I wanted to show you. Um, and though she's, ex she's sort of skeptical about this, uh, she accepts what's said because if it's written on the wall, it must be the truth. It must be right. Um, even though on our end as readers, we are aware that the rules have literally been rewritten. Okay. Um, you know, Again, these small changes over a long period of time make it difficult for masses to realize what is happening. Um, let me read this final thing to you here regarding the, the issues with the, the rewriting of the rules. It says, some days afterwards, it was announced from that, that from now on, the pigs would get up uh, an hour later in the mornings than other animals, and no complaint was made about that either. So another rule changed. Um, Finally, we've got the issue with the windmill, okay? It's, uh, it's been blown down. And, the, and what I want to ask you guys is how does Napoleon handle this devastating situation? Well, first thing he does, he blames Snowball. Snowball becomes a sort of convenient scapegoat for Napoleon. You know, by creating this hatred towards Snowball, um, you know, the animals will be out to get him, they'll resent him, and it would eliminate a huge threat for Napoleon. You know, he can continue to lead without opposition if he could just get the rest of them on board with that. Um, he can blame also, oh, this is also convenient for Napoleon because he can blame any of his failures on Snowball and sort of deflect attention away from his own corruption. So, you know, anything goes wrong, it's not Napoleon's fault, okay? It's always someone else's. So people won't come to resent him. So anyway, that's the final comment that I have uh, in regards to this chapter. Just let me know if you have questions. See you later, guys.